listen to these words. It comes right out of the Word of God. The veil is torn, the doors fling wide. I see glory as I run inside your throne room. Before you, I Come on, just worship him for a moment right now. Hallelujah. 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 Blessed be your name, Lord. Thank you that we have access to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Yes. Sing out everybody. 
rescued me. Yes. Love came down and set me free. I am yours. I am forever yours. Mountain high and valley low. I see now and remind my soul. His name is Jesus. Praise God. Psalms 24 reminds us the earth is the Lord's. And they that dwell therein, he's still in control. Hallelujah. You know, sometimes we feel like praising him just with all of our voice. But I want you to know today, I declare I'm going to praise him. He is worthy all the time, every day. Can I hear amen? amen? Every day, today, amen. Lift your voice again with me in praise. Bless you, Lord. You came where we were. You sought us out. <laughs> thank you. And I thank you for your divine presence here in this house today. We have the privilege of praying and worshiping together to believe together to come alongside those who feel that they're at a low point in their lives. As I look around this sanctuary today, I see many that have been touched by loss of a loved one. It brings heaviness and hurt. But Lord, you're the comforter. You're our comforter. You're our source of strength. We bless your name this morning. We thank you that we can look to you right now those are sick. I, I will just lift up in prayer right now Richard Crawford and Linda and their family. I just ask you, God, on their behalf, show your mighty grace. 
Show them your strength, Lord, when theirs seems so weak. And just have your way for Richard. We commit him to you, knowing that your care is best of all. Strengthen him. Give healing. I pray for Kathy Wilson today. I ask you, God, to minister your complete healing for her. For Linda and Jim Brackett, Lord, we pray for them this morning. We pray that you would help them. You would give recovery and healing. For Joe Irwin, I pray, God, your, gr your grace would just be manifest in his time of need in the name of Jesus. For Carol Harden, I ask you, God, be with her. For Kevin Conley, Lord, we just ask again that they will experience what we've been singing about here this morning, your love coming to rescue, to set us free. Hallelujah. To give us, Lord, your strength and your presence, and Lord, the character that you manifested in this world, that we will, as your children, would walk in that manner with the same mind that you had. In Jesus' name, would you just give the Lord a praise offering with your hands and voice? We, uh, we love you, Lord. We thank you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, you may be seated for just a moment. We're going to invite the ushers to come in just a moment. But let me just remind you that we're hosting a blood drive that will be on November 18th. And you can sign up for that and get an appointment, a time for you to donate if you just go on our website, gastoniafirst.org. And there you'll have to find a place you can just uh, enter your name and they'll give you a time so that you can donate. And it'll be such a blessing. This drive is going to help people in our community. So God bless you as you're faithful to do that. Ushers, would you come now and serve us as we just continue to worship the Lord. God is good and he is faithful and you've been faithful. We so appreciate all of you, your faithfulness and Pastor mentioned last week about just thank you for your generosity for the staff. But I would echo that today. Just thank you for your kindness, your generosity. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning again that you loved us so much. You gave yourself to take our punishment and to exchange our sins and give us righteousness through faith in you. We are grateful we can return in tithes and offerings. Lord, our stewardship to the resources you've entrusted to us. And we do that gratefully and with thanksgiving today. In Jesus' name, amen. While the ushers are waiting on us, let me just remind you that uh, we're going to receive a special thanks offering uh, November 22nd, am I right? November 22nd, and it's going to a Convoy of Hope. I like to just put in a word, having taken a trip with Convoy to Haiti, and tell you that these are people who don't only give gifts and feed children, but they also come alongside families to help them know how to grow food. It's one of the things that blessed my heart in Haiti was they were taking those who were in great need and teaching them a skill so that they began to earn money and sometimes producing food that Convoy buys back from them and feeds the children with. So these people are on the ground doing a great work, and I encourage you to remember that and uh, help us support Convoy of Hope. God bless you and thank you.
every time the soldier falls, they pay the price for liberty. Those fighting overseas, and everyone in Walter Reed, always send a prayer when you can for the sun. Never take it down. And every morning he'd salute that old red, white, and blue. Never heard him talk about his wounded head, the son of a said He'd say, Freedom comes with a cause every time a soldier falls. They pay the price for liberty. Those fighting overseas, and everyone in Walter Reed, always send a prayer when you can for the sons of sin. We found him sitting on the front porch like he had gone. Was a purple heart we never knew he had. This son of a said he'd say, "Freedom comes with a cost." Every time a soldier falls, they pay the price for liberty. Those fighting overseas. Everyone in Walter Reed Always send a prayer When you can For the sons of Uncle Sam He lost a son In Vietnam Grandpa was a son Are you thankful for our veterans? I love that Veterans Day is this week. Memorial Day is, as you know, in May, where we remember those who have fallen. And then Veterans Day is November 11th, where we thank and celebrate um, Everyone who's ever served, those who are serving now, and, um, and still to remember those who are falling, but to remember those who, who made that commitment. And um, I'm so glad that it's this week because I think it helps us in a way. We're, all of us are processing the events of this past week. We're processing the events of this whole year, this whole election season. Uh, many are wounded and hurting. But our democracy persists. I said our democracy persists. It's not gone. It's not going away. I'm proud to be an American. We owe so much of that truth about our democracy to the veterans that have served and are serving and have served faithfully for the past 245 years since June 14, 1775, when the Continental Army was mustered to fight the American Revolutionary War. In 1986, the producer of the National Memorial Day concert, Jerry Colbert, commissioned famous composer Henry Mancini to create a special medley 
arrangement uh, to honor the armed services of the United States. And the songs, when presented properly, are arranged in order of precedence for the armed forces. That is, from the youngest to the oldest. And so the first song is uh, the, the hymn for the Coast Guard, and then you'll have the Air Force. We didn't use the Air Force much in the Revolutionary War. <laughs> uh, we have the Air Force, uh, the Navy, the Marines, and the Army, although the Navy and the Marines sort of fight about who, who was first. Uh, you know that I attended the National Memorial Day concert in 2019, and we had hoped to take a whole group of us this year uh, to that event. And uh, we were ready, weren't we, Doug? And, um, but every year at that concert, and that was where that medley was first put together, was commissioned by them, they present this Armed Forces salute. And so I'm going to play for you this morning uh, the video from 2019. The concert, it was the last time the concert was live and in person. They did uh, sort of something different this past year because they had to. And you'll hear each service announced, and you'll see that some in the crowd are standing there. Some of those faces you'll even recognize. But as we, as we have this video, please stand. If you've ever served or you're serving now, please stand when your song is played from your branch of the service. And then you sit down. And then we're going to, unless if we haven't served, we're going to remain seated, and we're going to go as crazy as we can uh, as people are standing for their branch, and we honor them. And then when it's concluded, I just would like to get every veteran that stood for your song just to come down front so that we can see you clearly and so that we then can stand for you and honor you in that moment. Also, if you're watching on Facebook and you are a veteran, uh, you served or you're serving, will you please make that note in the comments there? Let us know who you are and what branch of the service you were in. In fact, if you're here today and you want to do that on your phone, that's fine with me, or if you want to do it later. But we just want to celebrate you and remember, and we don't want to lose those who are watching because there are many that are watching. So we want to appreciate you as well. So we're going to play that video now. Stand for your song, and when it's all done, if you're a veteran, come down front so we can really appreciate you. United States Coast Guard!
Oh man, you guys are the best. Isn't this a beautiful group? Every year this is so moving when I see and remember who. Can we appreciate them? You may be seated, everyone. Thank you, veterans. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for what you do. Just as a, just a small point of, of personal privilege, I wanted to uh, recognize Pastor Derwin Ward, who is the father, and, and Terry Ward, the mother of Hannah Ward. What is her rank? She's a captain in the United States Air Force. Listen, listen, she flies the huge C-17 transport plane. She flies a plane that is worth more than $200 million every day when she goes to work. And so, yeah, can we appreciate Hannah Ward? Uh, we're proud of you, Hannah. If you see the back of Pastor Derwin's car it says something like my daughter wears combat boots or something like that and uh, also remember friday night of this week gordon moat seven o'clock it is not ticketed we ask if you can bring a ten dollar bill with you uh just to help offset that but uh but we're not going to shake you down for it or anything like that and um but that's going to be an incredible uh and he will do some he will do some patriotic uh music as well that night and those who were here last time that he came, I had so many tell me that it was the best concert that they'd ever been to. This guy is really an unbelievable artist uh, vocally, but on this keyboard, this piano, it's, it's really ridiculous uh, how this guy uh, expresses. And so I promise you, if you can be here on Friday, invite others. Um, if you can be here, you will not regret uh, being here for that moment Friday night. And, uh, and to our Marines, uh, November 10th, two days from now, right? <laughs> that's, the, that's the birthday of the Marine Corps. It's always that day just before Veterans Day. So on this day that we honor so many warriors, I want to look at a different kind of warfare, uh, which you know only means one thing. It means spiritual warfare. I want to talk about spiritual warfare. And my prayer today is that this passage of Scripture will meet us wherever we are, that it'll meet us wherever we are. I, I can tell you, I hope that I never approach the pulpit uh, in a cavalier way, but I absolutely do not feel cavalier today to come and, and speak to you because I don't have all the answers. I don't. But this book does have all the answers. And I believe that if we'll come to the Bible, the Bible will come to us. I said, if we'll come to it, it'll come to us. It's alive, it's quick, it's powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword. A little bit ahead of myself, but sharper than any two-edged sword. And so if we'll come to the Bible, the Bible will come to us. And sometimes it may be that when the message is delivered, I just pray that God let each one hear it the way they need to hear it. Let it apply the way it needs to apply to each one of us, including me, including me first. Let's let it help us today Ephesians chapter 6 beginning at verse 10 it says this finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers against the authorities against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm stand therefore 
That's the fourth time we've seen the word stand. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. So this breaks down into some very edible chunks for us this morning. It breaks down into some pieces that we can eat. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Be strong in his mighty strength. Be empowered through your union with him. Draw your strength from him, that strength which his boundless might provides. Be supernaturally infused with strength through your life union with the Lord Jesus. Stand victorious with the force of his explosive power flowing in and through you. Be strong. Be strong. It's really saying he uses three, three words for strength. It's like if you go to Starbucks and they've got, they've got, um, they've got tall, uh, venti, what, what are they? A, a large, uh, grande, but they all mean large. They all mean large. Every, different languages, it, they all, every word means large. He uses three different words for strength, but they all mean strength. He's saying, find your strength in the strength of his strength. Anytime the gospel writer or the, or the Bible writer triples down on a word or a concept, it's important. Find your strength in the strength of his strength. That's strength squared. Be strong. This strength is not dependent. Listen to me. Listen to me. This strength is not dependent on any other thing. Nothing else. It is not dependent on any other thing outside of the incredible, limitless, transcendent, overpowering, literally otherworldly power of God. All power. That's what omnipotent means. All the power rests in him. And Paul's saying, tap into that. Tap into that kind of power. Be strong. Don't be weak. Don't be afraid. Don't be angry. Don't be tore up. Don't be panicky. Be strong. In the strength of his strength. Listen, people right now are hurt. People are afraid. People are wounded. People are, are striving. People are confused. And maybe that's you this morning. But if it is, the Apostle Paul is speaking to us from the words of this letter to the Ephesians saying, be strong, trade that in. All of that confusion and the hurt and the torment even, possibly that you're facing, that you're dealing with, take all of that and trade it in for the strength of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Make that exchange this morning. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying to us. Trade that in for the strength of God. How, Paul? Well, I'm glad you asked that. And then twice, just like little bookends, twice he says, put on the whole armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness, spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. And then again, he says, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. And then he says, so just stand twice. Put on the armor of God. Put it on, put it on, put it on. It's the answer to how we are strong in the strength of his strength. It's how we find that strength is by putting on this armor. You got to put it on. You got to put it on. Before he gets into the armor, he says this, and it's a very, ah, uh, this may just be the most important point of the day, I'm not sure. But he says, we don't fight against flesh and blood. We don't fight against people. 
as a, as a child of God, as a believer, as a Christian, I am not entitled ever in the course of this walk from now to the time that I'm taken home to be with the Lord. I am not entitled to have human enemies. I know that's a disappointment. <laughs> it's a disappointment for me. I enjoy being angry as much as the next person. <laughs> We don't fight against people. Our fight is not against people on earth. Our fight is not against human opponents. So if you're fighting a person or you're fighting a group of people, Paul is telling us that we're missing the real opponent. We're missing the real battle. We've traded in for something else. And this is what I think we do. Sometimes I think we hear that and we say, okay, Pastor Dennis, okay, Pastor Paul, we get it. We're not allowed to have human enemies. We're not fighting against flesh and blood. This is a spiritual battle. So if I fight this person and call it spiritual, then I'm good, right? David Allen Greer was doing his stand-up routine one time, and he was talking about all these athletes that thank God for giving them the strength to do what they did out there on the, the field of play, which is great. I'm not critical of that, and I don't think he was either. He was, he was being funny. But he said, uh, he said he saw a boxer one time that just knocked this guy out, and they came to him, put the mic in his face, and he said, I'd just like to thank my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for giving me the strength to pert near kill this man with my bare hands. We, we, sort of, we sort of find that cheat. We sort, of, we sort of find that cheat that if I, listen, if I can spiritualize my human opponent, then I can call it spiritual warfare. And I'm allowed to have this human enemy because I'm doing it, I'm fighting him in the name of God. Our battle is not against people at any time. That includes sons-in-law, mothers-in-law. This is not just about politics. We're not allowed to have human enemies. Our battle, who are we battling? Our battle is against spiritual wickedness. Our battle is against spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies. Paul is referencing spiritual forces of the unseen world in this passage of Scripture. The spiritual world. And when I say spiritual world, I mean literally the spiritual world. Spirits. Spirits. Rulers, authorities, cosmic powers over this present darkness. Spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Some people believe that the Apostle Paul is laying out sort of a structure of various ranks of demons. And he may be. There are other scriptures that provide some illumination to us about spiritual forces in heavenly places, demonic beings, the devil and his minions. But the point is that we're not fighting people. We're fighting these spirits. We're fighting spiritual wickedness. Not physical. It is not a battle against people, physical enemies. It is a battle against an enemy that we cannot see with our human eye. It's against Satan and his hosts. It's against those philosophies and the false truths and the half-truths that these forces of wickedness promote. Every system that rejects the system of God. That's what we're fighting. These spiritual battles. So with that in mind, if we're fighting things that we cannot see, if we're fighting things that do not exist in a, in a physical way, then we have to change our methods and our means in fighting them. We cannot use earthy, earth, the tools that these people that stood down front, what they would have used, don't work in spiritual warfare. Paul said in 2 Corinthians that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not physical. They're not fleshly. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not physical for fighting purposes, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. In other words, if we're going to fight spiritual battles, if we're going to fight spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies, we fight those battles with spiritual weapons, with spiritual tools. We have to lay hold of that. 
And a huge part of our frustration, I think, in this life, and I think it's universal, I think a huge part of our frustration is that we're fighting people with physical methods and means thinking that we're doing something for ourselves or for the kingdom of God when we should be fighting spiritual opponents with spiritual weapons. And Paul lays it out for us. We're going we're gonna to put some things on. We're going to pick some things up in the armor of God. Why? Because this is how we access the strength of his strength this is how we access it and it starts in that place of our life where we get dressed where we put on what we're going to battle with it's very personal I can't put the armor of God on you you remember how when Saul tried to put his armor on David David said I can't use this stuff let me put my own armor on. Let me go in the way that I know. I can't put, I can't put the armor of God on my, on my children or on my spouse. But I am the only decision maker about whether it goes on me. Do I put this on? Do I pick these things up or not? It's a personal decision. Every person in this room this morning has that decision. But here's the deal. If we don't accept this equipment, we can't fight this battle. If you try to skip this, this portion, you might as well go home. You can't fight this battle. Listen, Roman soldiers were everywhere in Ephesus. They were everywhere. This was the Roman Empire. They were always armored up. Paul was in prison as he's writing this. This is one of the prison epistles. He's in prison as he's writing this. And he very well may have been looking at a Roman soldier guarding him as he's pinning the words to this. And he's, he's starting to make this, this analogy as he's, as he's laying this in for us. And he kind of gives it in the order that it has to happen. He says, first of all, you have to put on the belt of truth. People didn't wear belts. It, everything was the, the, these, these open, long, flowing robes. You didn't wear belts just for walking around. But when you knew you were going to be involved in some sort of athletic competition or some sort of battle, that's where they would talk about And they said, gird up your loins. That's what they were talking about. They were saying, get your skirts pulled up and put your belt on so you can move a little bit. And that belt was very important because not only did it, did it gather up and give you the freedom, the agility to move and do some things, but it held the breastplate in place. It was where the scabbard was, was held for your sword. And so if your belt was messed up, you were messed up. And if ever, anybody posts quotes from the message today, don't post the gather up your skirts thing. <laughs> the belt was the first thing to go on. When it was time to go, put on the belt. And it's the belt of truth. What is the truth? Your word is truth. God's revealed truth in his word. We can't just go with our version of the truth. We can't just sort of figure things out for ourselves and say, well, this is just the way I always have seen it and put that on. You're going to have a belt that is insufficient for spiritual warfare. It's got to be the belt of truth, the truth of God's word, God's revealed truth. It's got to, it's got to possess some element of our own truthfulness. Can I be truthful about myself? Can I be truthful about what I'm facing? Jesus told the woman at the well that the time is coming and, and is already here where the Father is looking for worshipers who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. This belt of truth is pivotal. It's important. This belt of truth would include a lifestyle that demonstrates truth. If you can't walk in the truth, if you can't walk in the truth, none of the rest of this will work. And then He says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness, just a big... A big word that means rightness with God, being right, making right choices, right living, doing the right things, walking in the right way. He's saying, know the truth and walk in righteousness. Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Free to do what? To walk in righteousness. Sometimes we want to give ourselves a pass on that. Nobody's perfect. And that's true. Nobody is perfect. 
But when we expose ourselves to the truth of God's word, he does give us the strength of his strength then to walk in righteousness, to do right things in the right way, at the right time, with the right attitudes. And then he says, for shoes, this is what I want you to do for shoes. For shoes, put on your feet whatever will help you walk in the gospel of peace. I love that he doesn't give this great long description about, you know, he didn't say strappy sandals. He didn't say combat boots. He didn't say sneakers for running. He just said, whatever helps you to be the most prepared to share the powerful gospel of peace in your life, put on what allows you to walk that way. Put that on your feet. Isaiah said, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. Good news. Gospel. That's what gospel means, you know. How lovely on the mountains are the, the feet of those who bring the gospel, publishing peace, bringing news of good, publishing salvation, saying, our God reigns, our God reigns, our God reigns, our God reigns. Put that on your feet, the apostle's saying, so that you can walk that way, that you can walk that direction. It is a lifestyle of peace. It is a lifestyle of announcing peace. It is a lifestyle that says, no matter what, our God reigns. That's what Pastor Creel said this morning when he got up. Our God reigns. For shoes, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. And it's not just peace. It's not some namby-pamby, physical, earthly, earthy, we've cobbled together some agreement and somehow we finally have what we call peace. But it's really just a, a bunch of war that's battled, bottled up and it's about to bust loose. This is the peace that the gospel brings. It's real peace. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for all who believe. The gospel is the power of God. Be prepared to announce that. Put that on your feet. And then he says, the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. The Roman shield was wooden. It was about two and a half feet wide by about four feet tall. It was covered in leather. And then when they were going into battle, when especially if they expected that there might be flaming arrows coming at them, which would have been in a, a way to, to battle at that time. They would, they would wet down the, the leather on their, on their shields so that when those flaming arrows would come from the enemy, that when they would hit that leather that had been soaked in water on that wooden shield, it would be extinguished as soon as it got there. This thing that would, that would have maybe set a wooden shield ablaze or that would have caused harm or set their clothing on fire. It's extinguished as soon as it hits that leather that had been doused with water. This is something, this shield is also something that is wielded in community. The Roman soldiers, and you've seen this in various places, you've seen this portrayed in some way, but those Roman soldiers could take those shields that were two and a half feet wide or and they could come side by side, shoulder to shoulder, and they could lock those shields in place across the front, and then there'd be some behind them that would put their shields and lock them in place right behind that front line, and they could create this protective shell this protective coating that could only be achieved in community so that then as those fiery darts would come at the church they could or i'm sorry their cohort they could then shoulder to shoulder pull up those shields that were rooted in their faith close their ranks and be protected from arrows and rocks or spears or anything else that the enemy wanted to throw at them they were protected our faith must remain intact not just by ourselves, but in our community, our church. Our faith must remain intact. This is what faith does. Faith helps, helps us to see things that we cannot see in the physical. We see things spiritually that we cannot see physically. Can you see how helpful that would be in a battle where you're fighting things that you can't see physically? That's what faith does. We see things spiritually that don't yet exist physically. And then he says, put on the helmet of salvation. Listen, if you know the Lord, you've been saved. You've been saved. It's, it's sort of an old-fashioned word. When did you get saved? But it's a good word. 
If you've come to Christ, you got saved, and this, this helmet of salvation is that thing that reminds you that my soul is saved wherever this battle takes me, whatever this battle involves, however that long this battle lasts, this enemy of my soul can't touch my soul. They can never get there. That's what I want to keep close to my head. That's what I want to keep close to my mind, that I'm always remembering who I am in Jesus Christ. There's no one that has access to your soul except for who you give access. That's why Jesus, the one who holds all power, still stands there and knocks. That passage that I'd referenced in 2 Corinthians, it links up in this way. Listen, he says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments. Listen, this helmet. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. In other words, any time I have a thought that, that raises up to tell me something that violates, that contradicts what I already know to be true about God, I take that thought and I throw it away. I take it captive. I say, oh, no, you don't. You're not going to have access there. You don't get to live there. That's why I'm wearing this helmet of salvation that declares who I am in Jesus Christ. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Roman soldiers carried a short, two-edged sword that was good for thrusting in, in close combat. And it was that passage in Hebrews that I referenced earlier that said that the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged two sword. But here's the temptation that takes us right back to where we started. We want to take the sword of the Spirit and cut people with it. James Robinson once said, we're trying to kill each other with spiritual truth bullets. At a tough time in our history as Christians. We want to take this word sometimes and use it to come at somebody else. When the truth is, what God has planned for us is to let this word, which is so sharp, is to let it do surgery on us. It is, it is sharp like a sword. It, it is sharp like a scalpel. Let it do surgery on us. That's what that passage said in Hebrews. Sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The Word of God. This sword is designed to do surgery on me. Thought we were talking about going to battle, Pastor Dennis. We are. We are. That's what we're talking about. This sword will work on us. Then we're going to pray. Pastor Derwin, you can come. He said, you're going to pray in the Spirit. You're going to pray in the Spirit. You know what that means? I mean, I know what it means to us, and I, and I think that's true. But even, you know, for a Pentecostal, if a Pentecostal is praying in tongues, what does that mean? It means that we're praying what God wants, not praying what we want. And anytime I'm doing that, I'm praying in the Spirit. If I'm in tongues, Paul said, I pray, in, I pray with the Spirit and I pray with understanding. But whichever time I'm doing that, I, the, the goal, the objective is, Pastor Krill said it a couple of weeks ago in here as he got up to, to pray. He said, we're going to pray, but this is what, guess what? We're not going to tell God, we're going to let God tell us. We're going to pray. We're not just praying what, what we want. We're praying what God wants. All prayer and supplication. In other words, we're going to take all that gear that we put on in the middle of this spiritual battle that we've got raging and will be raging. That battle's not going to go away until it's gone away for good. 
And in the middle of all of that, we're going to put on the right things. We're going to pick up the right things. And then he says, and then we said, then we go, then we can go, we can go get people, then we can go. No, no, no. That's when you start to pray. That's when you pray. You pray, you pray, you pray, you pray. And please don't let this just be a Sunday school lesson this morning about the, the sword of the Spirit. And think, well, I, we have heard that. I've seen the flannel graphs, Pastor Dennis. The sword of the Spirit, I got it. This is not just a Sunday school lesson. This is a everything I needed to know I learned in Sunday school lesson. We pray. We pray. And here's the thing, and I do not mean this harshly. I don't mean this in an accusatory way, but I mean it as the truth that we've got Christian people around us in this church and everywhere else who talk a Christian game, who talk a Christian talk, but they really never, ever spend time in this book or spend time in prayer. And then they wonder why they're tore up all the time. Why am I so angry? Why am I so frustrated? Why am I so afraid? Why am I so wounded? Because you let all of those things that he listed in this sixth chapter of Ephesians lay there unattended and then walked out into battle. Then you got hurt. You weren't dressed for it. You weren't ready. He said, all prayer and supplication, we pray. We aren't fighting people. We aren't fighting in our own strength. And the truth is, in the traditional sense, what Paul says more than anything else, what's the battle plan, Paul? What's the battle plan? He said, the battle plan is to stand. How many times do we see in the Old Testament, just stand and see the salvation of the Lord? Let me do it. He said, stand, stand, withstand. Having done all to stand, well, why don't you just stand there? <laughs> some more dressed the way we're supposed to be dressed listen to this and I'm almost done the greatest spiritual battle that has ever been won and that ever will be won was won by a man who refused to fight people it said like a lamb led to the slaughter, he opened not his mouth. They're going to crucify him. Like a lamb led to the slaughter. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Come on, Jesus, fight back. It's like, we're his, we're like, we're, we're, we're his corner man. Get him. Go. go. We'll do something. But in his moment of battle, by the way that he prepared for, in a garden where he prayed and his sweat came as great drops of blood, in that moment of preparation for battle where he's saying, not my will, but your, be, your will be done, he was preparing himself for a moment where he would just stand there. But he stood in the gap, and it was in his standing. It was his, Listen, he could have wiped them all out. It, it wouldn't have been a struggle. But if he had done that, he would have lost the battle. That's hard to understand, isn't it? If he had wiped them all out, he would have lost. He won, but not getting sucked into the kind of battle they wanted. So that that lamb, like a lamb led to the slaughter who opened not his mouth, that meek lamb that we see in the Gospels, we then turn over a few pages to the book of Revelation, and we find a lamb sitting on the throne with people gathered around saying, worthy, worthy, worthy. Who can open this book? Who can open this scroll? No one's worthy. Wait, there's this one lamb that through not fighting, fought and won and is worthy. And that's what God wants for us to learn, how to fight, not fight. By understanding that what we're doing spiritually is a spiritual battle and it is not like normal fighting. And that is accessible to us this morning. Be strong in the strength of his strength. We can lay hold of that. This is what I want to do before we leave today. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or say, Pastor Dennis, I'm so angry right now. I just want to kill people. I don't want that. 
But there's this incredible song that Pastor Derwin does. It's on their album called Run to You. And I just want to have us just stay in our seats. If you wish to stand in response to what you're hearing in, in your worship, that's fine. But we're not asking for a response during the song. I just want to let Pastor Derwin minister to us and, and to the Lord. And if you couldn't get there through the message, let, let, let this worship wash over us and get us to a place where we're ready to go take on this week in the way that God really needs us and wants us to. Pastor, lead us. What do I do when I'm broken? What do I do when life goes wrong? What do I do when there's no music? What do I do when there's no song? I run to you. I run to you. And from the storm to your arms I run. secret place and when I do my hopes renew I run to you what do I do when darkness lingers what do I do when I'm afraid I run.